Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are on the ball we all inhabit. I'm Andrew, and today I would like to teach you how to find the x-intercepts of the following function, x raised to the fifth minus 5x raised to the third plus 4x. So first thing is, do not lose sight of what we are trying to do. Let's pretend you have a graph and it looks something like this. The x-intercepts are then going to be those locations, or the x-values, right, of the points that cross the x-axis, right? meaning x-intercepts, they're intercepting the x-axis. So you, it actually turns out that you now know something in common about these three points, all right? Now, what do you know in common about those three? They all have something in common. Not only do they lie along the x-axis, and that would be true, but you actually know something about the value of one of the coordinates of those points. Remember, every point has two values to it. It has an x and a y. Do you know one of those two for every one of these points here? Yeah, the y value, right? The y value of every single x-intercept will always be zero. That's always going to be the case. So in other words, the y value or the function's value of the x-intercepts will be zero, okay? Now that's helpful because that will allow us to plug in zero here to this function and allow us to start gaining a little insight about how to solve this. Now, before we get to some, you know, algebra, just think about this for a second. Just look at the function, okay? Is there an x-value that you know of that would cause this side to go to zero or to become zero to make this whole statement true, that zero is somehow equal to, and which it should be, equal to zero, right? What do you think? Just think about it. Did you guess zero? Yeah, right? If this term is zero and this term is zero and this term is zero, this whole side goes to zero. So guess what? That would be x equaling zero is one of your x coordinates of an x-intercept. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that if you look back over the picture over here, and I just drew a random figure, but this function should be passing through the origin right there. Okay, it should be passing through that origin. That's what it's telling me. Okay, now you might say, oh, good, great. All right, I'm going to guess the rest. But the problem is when you start thinking, or you might even say, okay, good, I'm done, which that's not good. Because yes, you found a value, but does that mean that's the only value? Not exactly, right? Not exactly. So the idea here is going to be, how do we do it, right? How do we then find those missing values if there are any missing values? So that's where factoring comes in. So what you want to do, and every problem is different. So I have a whole bunch of videos that they're different functions that I've solved. So take a look at more examples because how I approach this one might be different than how I might approach a different function. All right, so let's start to factor this. So I'm looking at these terms and I'm trying to find the greatest common factor. And I realize that X, right? Every term has a common X. So basically every term now I pull out an X and I'm going to reduce everything by a value of x, so that becomes x to the fourth, minus then five x to the second, plus then four. Okay, great. Now I like it, after we factor, we get two terms here. We get a term outside the parenthesis and a term inside the parenthesis. Now the idea here is that if this term is zero, then I could care less what's inside of here, that's gonna be zero. Uh, excuse me, I could care less what's in here. This whole side will become zero because zero times whatever is going to be zero. So in other words, if x is zero here, then the value inside this parenthesis would be zero minus zero plus four. So zero times a positive four, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, is still zero. That's what I mean, that's what I mean. This x, okay, if that's zero, this whole side goes to zero, and guess what, I found then an x-intercept. But wait a minute, that's what we said before intuitively. Ha ha ha, see, okay? Exactly. Then conversely, if I set this equal to zero, or in other words, if I find the x values that make this term go to zero, then I could care less what this is. And again, the whole right side would go to zero. So what we do from what we do at this point is we break this up into two problems. We say, okay, I want to find the x value when this term, whatever it is, it could be squared, it could be to the fourth, it could be x plus one, I don't care. But whatever this thing is, well, I would need an extra parenthesis around that, right? Um, I don't care what it is, but that's what I would make equal to zero, then I would solve it, okay? So in this case, I mean, this is easy to solve. It's just already solved for us, so that's done. But here we have x to the fourth minus five x squared plus four, and I wanna find the x values here that make this thing equal to zero, okay? Now you might say, okay, well, how do we do this? You're like, oh my goodness, it's a quartic. What am I gonna do? Well, I bet you can solve this. x squared, here, tell me, x squared, minus 5x plus 4 is equal to 0. What would this be? 
And you might say, oh, great, two numbers that multiply to a positive four, but then that add to negative five. And you're like, oh, right, okay. It would be x minus four and then x, x minus one, right? And negative four and negative one multiply to positive four and then a negative four plus negative one add up to negative five. And that would be right, okay? These are your factors, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, I know how to do this procedurally, right? Set this x minus four equal to zero. Why do you do that? Well, you do it because, look, you got the two terms again. And if this thing is zero, then the whole side goes to zero. And since you set this thing, I don't even know what that looks like. It almost looks like a happy, sad, uh, sideways happy face. Anyway, um, that's equal to zero. I don't know what that is. That doesn't look any better. But okay, yeah, we'll go with it. Um, so what was I saying? Right. So we set, we set this equal to zero uh, because, again, if this term goes to zero, then zero times anything I could kill us with that is would be zero. So you break that up again, that's always what you've done, and you realize now your terms here would have been x equals positive 4 and x equals positive 1, okay? Now, oh, by the way, also what you can do is plug that on into the calculator. Watch, I got a quadratic program. Here, take a look. And then, oh, if you want to learn how to uh, code this into your calculator, which I highly suggest you do, take a look in the link, uh, take a look in the, excuse me, description below. I'll leave you a link to it. It's like a two or three, uh, three minute video. I don't remember. Anyway, it's very quick. So plug in your a value, according to this function over here, the a value was a one, right? That's the leading coefficient. Then uh, the next one was a minus five. The next one was a positive four. And oh my goodness, look, four and one, right? That's what we said, four and one, okay? So anyway, I just double checked myself there. I know I'm doing it right. Now, this works out to be the same exact idea, okay? There's only one little difference, is that when you factor this one now, we still think the same thing, two numbers that multiply to positive four, but that add to negative five, it's going to be a negative four and a negative one. The only difference here is that it's not gonna be just x and x this time, it's going to be x squared and x squared. So in other words, the pattern here is that whenever you have like x to some number, then another term where it's x to the half of that number, then you have a constant term out there. You can always use this kind of factoring technique where then your, lead, your x value in the binomial will be the square root of the leading value, okay? So you can always use that, all right? So in other words, if you had x to the a plus then x to the a over two plus then some constant term equal to zero, you can always approach this just like any old regular quadratic. And the only difference is then to get your x term to make sure you have the right superscript there, you just square root the x value. Okay. Generally speaking, this will only really work with the with even uh, functions, meaning even numbers up there, even powers. Okay. So anyway, let's get back to business. So we're going to set each of these now equal to zero. Why? For the exact reasons I discussed over here. We got two terms. If either one of them goes to zero, then the whole side goes to zero. And since this is equal to zero, that's what I'm trying to solve for, right? So we got x squared minus four equaling zero. We got x squared minus one equaling zero. All right, so now just add the four on over to the right-hand side. So you're gonna get x squared being equal to four. Square root both sides, so you're gonna get x squared being equal to now plus or minus two. Well, not x squared, right? What am I even talking about? That square root x squared is just x, okay? So then x being equal to plus or minus two. All right, so now when you, you have now two other x-intercepts, you have x being equal to negative two, and you also have x being equal to positive two. Now the same thing over here, add the one to the right hand side so you get x squared being equal to one. When you square root both sides, now you're gonna get x is equal to plus or minus one. In other words, you got two more. So x is gonna be equal to negative one and x will be equal to now a uh, positive one. So you actually should have five intercepts. In other words, this function should cross the graph five times. Now sometimes that will be the case when you have a leading coefficient of five, you'll get all five uh, x-intercepts, but it, there's no law that says you need all five, okay? as you might have noticed in some of our other examples. Now, if you're like, okay, that sounds great, I get it, but I'm not convinced, I wanna see it, sure, plot it, right? So do x raised to the fifth, then hit the arrow over button, do minus then five uh, x raised to the third, and then hit the arrow over and then do plus four x, and go to zoom standard, and here is now the function. So take a look, ready? Let's increase the size, and here we go. So where does the function cross the x-axis? Looks like it cross it here, 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 and here. Five times, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And that's exactly what we said it should be, all right? So guys, thank you so very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. I do hope this helps. 
And if it does, like, subscribe, maybe even tell some of your classmates. I appreciate it very much. I look forward to helping you with more problems. Take care.